This ECE lesson is titled, The Ideal Op-Amp Compared to a Real Op-Amp, an Experiment. We will especially focus on the zero input current, zero input voltage model. I find that newcomers frequently find this model rather troubling. It looks like some sort of a combination of a short circuit and an open circuit. What good could come from that? Well, we will build a classic non-inverting op-amp with a gain of two and explore the validity of the model and also discuss some of the physical rationale for the model. Not having an ideal op-amp in the parts bin, I'm going to choose a 741 op-amp, a venerable design to say the least. And this drawing shows that an op-amp is an active device, therefore power supplies need to be provided. We will use a digital analog discovery model to provide the plus and minus power supplies of the circuit and later in the lesson to also provide time varying inputs and give us oscilloscope functionality via USB uh, connection to our computer. This shows the schematic of the circuit we will be building. Note that those plus and minus power supplies are no longer explicitly shown. Frequently they are not on op amp schematics. Let's build a circuit and measure some voltages, deduce some currents, and see how well that uh, ideal op-amp model works. For the input voltage, let's take a AA battery, a 1.5 volt battery. You can see the actual values of R1 and R2 are 987 ohms and 986 ohms, respectively. And we'll use the 741 as our op-amp. And let's measure the voltage at the positive terminal, at the negative terminal, and at the output. Here is the 741 on the proto board. It's an 8 pin dual inline package, pins 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And we have inputs coming into the plus and minus input, the output coming out on pin number 6. You can check out the pinouts on the 741 on a number of uh, source sites. A digital analog discovery kit to apply uh, power supply voltages to the op amp, in this case plus and minus 5 volts. This AA battery will represent V sub N for the op amp circuit. It will be approximately 1.5 volts, not exactly. Apply power to the op amp. This is not V in now, but this is the plus power supply and negative power supply are coming from that analog device slash digitalent model that we saw plus 5 volts and minus 5 volts and we also have a ground. And the proto board has been wired so we can measure the output voltage coming from pin 6 of the op amp relative to ground as seen here. Let's measure the voltage at our input. It's 1.55 volts. That's the voltage at V sub P. Next let's measure the voltage at V sub N. That is 1.551 volts. For our next measurement, let's measure the output voltage V sub O. The output voltage is 3.105 volts. So here we've recorded our results. We've measured V sub P as we see here, V sub N, and also the output voltage. Now, according to the ideal op-amp model, VP minus VN should be zero. The node voltage at VP should be equal to the node voltage at VN. In fact, they are within one millivolt, arguably the experimental accuracy of our digital multimeter measurement, but still leaving the possibility of a millivolt difference between them. And what about the currents flowing into the op-amp? We may deduce this current by looking at the current I1, I2, and then by KCL deduce what I sub N would be equal to. Shall we do that? So calculating I1, 1.551 volts divided by its resistor value gives us 1.573 milliamps. I2, the voltage across that resistor is 3.105 minus 1.551 using Ohm's law gives us 1.574 milliamps. Thus, by KCL, going back to our circuit, I sub N is equal to 1.574 milliamps minus 1.573 milliamps, which is equal to one microamp. We may summarize our experiments to date by saying, 
Vp minus Vn was not exactly zero, but it was on the order of one millivolt, and the input current was on the order of a microamp. Now, so long as we are applying KCL to nodes where the other currents are the order of many milliamps, this is a negligible current. So long as we're applying KVL to loops that are on the order of volts, this millivolt is a negligible voltage. In terms of the output voltage for the ideal op amp, it's 1 plus R1 over R2 equal 2 except that our 1K resistors are not exactly 1K, so using the measured values 2.001, that's the ideal. What we measured, the ratio was 2.003, much less than 1% difference and well within accuracy of our voltmeter. Now let's add to the experiment. Let's put a 2.2 kilo ohm resistor in series with the AA battery and the plus input. If the current I sub P is zero, there should be zero volts across this resistor. We'll do the experiment and see what happens. Here is that resistor in series with the input. Let's measure the voltage across it. We measure zero volts. Well, one millivolt would be half a microamp approximately for a 2.2K resistor. This implies it's less than a half a microamp. So I sub n was observed to be on the order of a microamp at the most, and this is in the sub-microamp regime. Adding to our experiment, suppose we add a load resistor to the output, so that instead of measuring the output voltage across an open circuit, through which no current is flowing, we have a 2.2 kilo ohm resistor. Now for an ideal op amp, we'll still measure the same output voltage, although now we have a current flowing through this requiring more current from the output of the op amp itself. Let's do that experiment. Before we add that load resistor, let's measure again the open circuit voltage. It's still 3.105 volts. Now let's add the load resistor of 2.2 kilo ohms. And with the load resistor, we measure again 3.105 to 3.04 millivolts. Essentially, the load resistor makes no difference. However, as a practical note, if we reduce the load resistor value to the point where it exceeds the 741's output current capability, that is in the order of 25 milliamps, then we will start to see significant deviations from the ideal model. So let's ponder what we have seen. We delivered 3.105 volts to the resistor. V squared over R indicates that was a little over 4 milliwatts. The battery supplied 1.5 volts times less than a microamp or on the order of a microamp. Anyway, we go from microwatts to milliwatts and from 1.5 volts to 3 volts. How does that come about? Well, we can say, oh, well, we used an operational amplifier, and that's what allowed us to do that. But there's a bit more to the story than this. Let's take a look at the circuit for that op amp. Here's a circuit schematic for the 741. V positive for the plus input, V N for the negative input. The battery was attached to these two terminals, to these two NPM bipolar junction transistors. Much more detail than we want to get into here. The resistor was attached here, and there are the two power supplies. What the input voltage does is essentially control the flow of power from those plus and minus 5 volt power supplies that we used to the load. In such a way that we get a voltage gain of 2, the output voltage was 3 volts, the input voltage was 1.5 volts, and a power gain on the order of 1,000 or more. And again, the input voltage is controlling, if for lack of a better word, as a variable valve that would allow the flow of power from plus VCC and minus VCC to the uh, load resistor. We model all those transistors and the power supplies as this device where we have a voltage controlled voltage source where the 
uh, gain, the amplification factor is extremely large. In the ideal model, infinite. In the actual model, very large, big enough to keep these input voltages in the millivolt range or less, and is a very large input resistance. In the ideal op amp infinite, such that IP and IN are zero, in the one that we have just seen in the submicroamp regime. Thus far, our experiment has used a DC input voltage, a simple 1.5 nominally input voltage. I wonder what would happen if we had a time varying input voltage. Well, we can use our digital analog discovery kit for that. We can set it to produce a sine wave at the input, use an oscilloscope to measure the waveform as a function of time, both at the input and at the output. Let's put a one volt peak value sine wave at one kilohertz in. Do we get a uh, our gain of two, a, a one kilohertz sine wave out with two volt peak. Let's check it out. Module and accompanying software allows us to use our laptop or a com any computer as the uh, oscilloscope. We have the horizontal scale, the time scale set to 500 microseconds per division or a half a millisecond per division. For both channel one and channel two, one volt per division vertically. And here are the resulting waveforms. The input waveform in orange or tan goes from zero to plus one volt back to zero to minus one volt, repeats itself every millisecond. And the output voltage in blue is a faithful reproduction of that. Namely, it goes from zero to two volts to zero to minus two volts and back again in one millisecond. It's a two volt peak value or four volt peak to peak one kilohertz sine wave. And again, that amplification comes from the input directing the flow of energy, electrical energy, to the output in the op amp. If I increase the frequency, keeping the time scale the same, we see the input still plus to minus one volt sine wave and the output voltage of faithful reproduction of that. So the operational amplifier works with both DC input signals and time varying signals so long as we are within the frequency limits of the amplifier. Now we could also check this with other waveforms, square waves, uh, sawtooths, and so forth. And in all cases, we would see that the output was two times for all intents and purposes the input voltage with this particular op amp circuit that we have built. And just to demonstrate with this waveform, again, it's not a sine wave now, but again, the output is a faithful reproduction, except with a voltage gain of two of what's at the input. In summary, I sub N and I sub P were in the microamp to sub microamp range. As long as in writing KCL at nodes, microamp currents are negligible compared to other currents, the zero amp model is good. That really means that as long as the resistors in the rest of the circuit are not too large. The zero amp model is good for the circuit we investigated here. And the voltages across the plus and minus inputs we found to be in the millivolt to sub millivolt range. One would say as long as other voltages in the KVL loops are volts to hundreds of millivolts, the zero volt assumption is good too. And again, it was in the circuit we investigated. The zero volt, zero amp model represents the fact that very small input powers are required to direct the flow of energy from power supplies to the load and operational amplifiers.